Hello and welcome to Masterclass number 12. My name is Maura Gamble from the Permaculture Education Institute and the topic for today's Masterclass is designing for water resilience in your garden. Now I'd like to welcome you all. I know there's well over a thousand people who've registered for this workshop from all parts of the world which is fantastic. I know some of you are are joining online now and, and welcome to you all. And I know some of you who uh, are joining in later on too. So um, hello to everyone and thank you so much for being here. The Permaculture Education Institute is based here in my home uh, at Crystal Waters Eco Village. And our role is to support people to become fantastic permaculture teachers. And we currently have students from all around the world joining on our programs, which are online, but flexible and and comprehensive. And you can start anytime and take as long as you need. So all of these workshops uh, and masterclasses are sponsored uh, through the Permaculture Education Institute and are free and accessible for everyone. Uh, I do have some really exciting news about these programs, and I'm going to tell you about them later on, because right now I think it's a good time to launch into the whole idea of why we're exploring water resilience. We have a water problem. It's actually a water crisis, really, globally and locally. There's probably around 70% of the fresh water that's used in the world that's used for growing food, and it's becoming increasingly uh, polluted and um, depleted, and we're having changes in rainfall patterns, more frequent droughts, um, aquifers are being drawn down so much that there there's concern of what's going to happen in the next 20 to 30 years. Same with the, the glaciers, they're melting and less access to those for, for people farming in the regions that are dependent on those. There's just so many different factors in play that are really making us look differently about how we grow food but even in our small gardens in permaculture backyards one of the things that i hear people say often is oh i don't i don't garden in summer because it's too hot and dry what i'd like to share with you now is really some key strategies about how to create a resilient food garden so how do you do that There's some key points that I wanted to mention, and these are what we're going to be working through. So essentially, we're going to be looking at water, how to slow it, how to spread it, how to sink it, how to store it, how to reuse it, and really thinking about planting differently or planting well. So let's start with the first one, slow it. So what are the ways that you can actually slow down the water flowing across your site? Um, Really, the first thing is actually to open up the soil, to bring the soil more alive. So the more the soil is alive and open and thriving, it will absorb more moisture. But there might be some ways that we need to open it to start with. And some things that are really good for this are planting deep, thick rooted plants like this daikon radish here that will help to really break and open the soil. Also a gentle forking or with a broad fork or a garden fork to open up and allow the water to run in. Or if you're working on a bigger scale, um, the deep ripper, like you can see here on the far right, it's a yeoman's plow. So actually there's these, it goes down, it slices and opens the soil. It doesn't turn it and doesn't disturb it so much. It just allows the water as it's flowing down the hill to be caught into these and then soaked into the soil. So this opening is a really important strategy to get get you started. Now once you've opened it, one of the things about uh, really trying to keep the water as high up in the landscape as possible, there's different ways of setting up your garden. So perhaps it may be a way of of terracing. So as you can see, um, the water here gets stored in each of these different garden beds that as the water's flowing down the hill, it slows down in these terraces and sinks into the soil. Then the next terrace and slows down and sinks. So really important part of helping to get water in the soil is this slowing strategy. So you can see here from a side perspective, rather than the water just running straight off down the hill, it gets caught regularly along these different um, interventions that are put in place for the purposes of collecting that water. Now, 
What's happening on the surface of the soil is also really important. If you have just an open garden, bare soil, nothing growing, no compost, no mulch, nothing really going on and just bare soil, inevitably the water <clears throat> will run as it as it's sort of flowing across your site it will just run straight off more rapidly so the more that you have things growing on the ground things um, green manures could be green manures or cover crops or gardens and understories and mulch materials and and sort of raised bands of of compost material for example this is going to be trapping the water as it moves across your site and give a chance for it to actually slow down and infiltrate into the soil. So the second point is about spreading it. So slowing it first and then spreading it. So the spreading of the water and one of the ideas around um, key line is to think about how you can redistribute water on your site. So um, one of the first strategies that I did in setting up my one acre was to do deep ripping that was slightly off contour. I'm not, I hope you can understand my little diagram on the side here. So you can see uh, there's the contour line and I have a ridge that runs straight down the middle of my, my property and off. And so basically the water was just shedding off the edges down to gullies. What I needed to do was to run rip lines using a using a tractor with a deep ripper and bring it slightly off contour so what you can see is that as the water started to run down the hill it was caught by those rip lines and brought back into the ridge line and so essentially um, those rip lines that were done every say 10 meters i think it was in the initial stages and each one of those rip lines was then <clears throat> excuse me planted up with um, a whole lot of really fast growing plants including things like canna and pigeon pea and lemongrass and and ice cream beans and a whole lot of really fast growing plants you can see in this one in the picture here there's the lemongrass and the mulberry and and behind you can see the cassava so these bands were planted up so not only was the water infiltrating down into the soil through the for the rip lines the plants were also helping to create this dense band that any um, materials would get caught behind and start to create an absorb sort of an absorption layer too for stopping material moving down the hill so these two things um, together were a really important strategy for starting out getting um, water held higher up in the landscape and redistributing spreading the water to different parts um, of the site so that you don't have sort of really wet spots and really dry spots and particularly when you're working um, on ridges for example or you end up with flooding spots how can you think how can you design your site to redistribute that so another part of spreading it is thinking about planning um, contour pathways and off those contour pathways have little um, little keyhole pathways that maybe form parts of terraces too so you can see from this picture here so basically um, running through the middle each terrace has a contour path and the water is directed from from well it's collected from the rain but also the pathways that go down the hill towards my house get redirected into these contour paths and then from there it gets directed into each of the little keyhole pathways along there so it's like this great big soak so it's this big collection and spread which means that I don't get this great big runoff of water happening when I have a rain event. It gets collected and spread to actually where I want it to go. So one of my favorite things to do actually is when there's a rain event is to get out into the garden and see where is it pooling, where is it running off, where are the places that are perhaps problematic and how can I through the simple act of of uh, making new pathways or new diversion drains or new collection points that I can that I can slow it and spread it. So the third point is sink it. How can you sink more of the water into your soil and into your site? So one obvious way that you hear a lot in permaculture is the idea of, of swales. So essentially it's a, a ditch, a long contour that um, it does, as we've just looked at, it does slow 
and spread the water but it also sinks it into the ground at these points so that there's this uh, sort of plume of infiltration below this area and it's a really important way to help to build up this the um, the water in the soil and it slows it down for long enough so that it does have a chance to sink into the soil and of course one of the most important things about um, sinking the water into your soil is having something to receive it and to store it and this is organic matter organic matter in the soil acts like a sponge and the more that you have in there the more that it's going to be able to hold and receive the moisture that um, you are directing into that area if you don't have enough organic matter it's either just going to leach th straight through um, and be lost from that area or it'll be just quickly evaporated or that you'll end up with runoff because it hasn't been that enough um, organic matter in the soil to actually soak it in and sponge it so that very rapidly the soil will get um, waterlogged and it'll just start running off the top so the ways to add organic matter there are so many different ways to add organic matter but the most obvious ones are adding lots of um, compost and adding chop and drop and mulches and manures and I'm not saying that um, it's necessary to to dig these into the soil what I'm suggesting is that you add them on the top and the soil organisms will take them down into the structure of the soil and build the structure of the soil the way that they that the soil life um, wants it to be so lots of material on top of your soil compost manures chop and drops mulches green manures anything that you can do to add organic matter to replenish organic matter it's no not any good just to do it once you really need to keep doing it because every time your vegetables and your trees are growing they're drawing from this organic matter and it actually um, it does get depleted as plants grow in that environment and you're harvesting so Think about this, how can you create a constant replenishment of organic matter? One of the simple ways I do that too is having plants like um, comfrey growing everywhere which are, are constantly just adding leaf matter back into the soil. Now another way uh, to sink water into the soil is this idea of, of things like banana circles which, are, which basically are soaks. If there's a point in your garden you get to the end of a pathway and rather than the water running off you can create a soak where the surplus water gets stored. So it may not need to be a pond, it can simply be this deep impression which you can fill with, with um, compost or mulch and this holds the moisture in there and infiltrates it into the soil um, so it's collecting it, not, not letting it disappear off your site. And then around this you can grow things that perhaps you wouldn't have been able to grow in that spot before because now you actually have the, sp the, um, the moisture in the soil to be able to do this. So you often see this um, demonstrated as say something like a banana circle or um, taro or any other kind of really water loving plants. So it, it takes some moisture into the soil and gives you a, a different type of environment to grow. Now wet pots are a really interesting concept that's actually quite an ancient idea um, originally um, I think done in many different parts of the world where there's quite arid environments so simple clay pots like this that are unglazed can be buried into the soil into the root zone and and you simply fill up these jugs of water so this is particularly for a smaller scale garden or it could be in pots and so you can see the little diagram on the top here how you can even connect them up with uh, little pipes that are, and then they're buried in the ground you just fill up the reservoir and then they basically infiltrate into the soil around the root zone so this is good for smaller gardens gardens in arid zones um, where it's even more difficult to get enough water into the soil so um, wet pots now the difference between these two the, these ones on the on the left are, are quite bigger ones and you can actually fill them up with a hose and it's important to put the lid on so they don't become mosquito habitat or that the water evaporates back out again the one on the left was one developed by a man in Brisbane and he glazed the top of them so that you, that bit would be sticking out of the soil and there wouldn't be a pooling of water around the surface where mosquitoes might might breed and he connected them up with this irrigation pipe so, 
So the fourth point that I wanted to talk about was storing the water. Now there's a lot of different ways of doing this too and I guess we've talked a little bit about that in terms of storing it in the organic matter in the soil but that's really about sort of sinking it into the soil. How can you store it above? So rainwater tanks, you know whereabouts can you install a rainwater tank in and around your structures collecting any rain that falls into tanks. I think I think I've probably got about 50,000 litres worth of rainwater tanks in and around um, all the roofs that I have on the site um, here at Crystal Waters, which means that I have a high tank, I have a mid tank, I have a low tank, and I always try and use the closest, but if, if that one runs out, then I can top it up from the one above. So I always have that higher potential to drain down lower into the garden. Um, this is a beautiful rainwater tank created by um, Art Ludwig, who has some amazing uh, grey water um, information, um, an excellent book that's been around for a really long time. And I love these handmade ferro cement tanks. Um, just, just gorgeous. So, you know, you can make them, you can access um, conventionally made ones. You can have above ground ones, you can have below ground ones. There's also tanks that can be um, underneath a house in kind of like a big, big um, bladder type situations. So having some kind of storage where you can collect the water and that can be redistributed to other parts of your site. As well as storing water in a tank, storing water in the landscape is also very important and these can be in large uh, dams or ponds or even small little garden ponds too. So the one on the left is at Crystal Waters and this this is one of the 17 dams that has been was created at Crystal Waters right at the early days using key line design strategies to hold the water high up in the landscape and to provide habitat, um, microclimate moderation, um, and also to create emergency sources of water in all different situations. Um, and so these dams uh, have mostly not been able to, mostly not been used because um, we've created water resilient gardens, but it's there. So it's this enormous backup. This idea with creating water resilience, I think means actually having multiple sources of water available to you. And that some of them you may not necessarily use, but they're there as a backup. Um, the picture in the middle is actually uh, from Sepp Holtz's uh, landscape and you can see how he also holds water up in his landscape and from these ponds he can distribute a long contour to a whole range of different gardens and orchards and and again you can see from that there are multiple sources of water and it's high up in the landscape. The picture on the right is, is a little pond in a, in a community garden in the middle of London and I've seen lots of different sorts of ponds that scale from this size to even tiny little ponds. This one's in a community garden in uh, West End in Brisbane and it's an old bathtub. So whatever you can find to use to hold water, to store water, to provide a source of water that can be used in the gardens but also to increase the habitat value too because once things go dry and you lose the ecological values of your garden then you lose all of those extra helpers. So making sure that you keep water in for your helpers too is, is absolutely fantastic. So this little pond, you can see on the top of it, there is the azolla growing, which is that floating fern. So at this point, you could come through and take off most of that azolla and use that as compost. Now this particular material, the azolla, when you put it on your garden, it acts like the most magnificent sponge and it breaks down very rapidly into humus. So if you can grow little ponds of this Azolla, uh, then it's going to be so, so advantageous. Now the thing is that if you're in an environment where this is suitable, this doubles every seven days. So you can take it out and it will re and it will regrow, and you can take it out and regrow. So not only do you have a little pond for lizards and bees and frogs and all sorts of of the helpers in your garden, you also have a source of material that's going to be improving the soil consistently and if you have a, a really dry time you also have a little bit of source of, of water these aren't main storage waters for um for um 
watering your garden so much as providing those other ecological services. Now, one of the ways that people are addressing really dry environments and, and often um, hard compacted sites in urban areas is the use of wicking beds. So essentially a wicking bed is a really large self-watering pot. There is uh, the medium at the base of the raised bed, which is a storage point for the water. And on top of this, you have about 30 centimeters of soil. So on the bottom, there'll be a piece of waterproof material to hold the water because it's like a big pot and then pebbles or small rocks that can be in the base, which stores the water in there and a pipe running through that to distribute the water because you feed it from the top. You can see from this little diagram, there's a little hose um, that fills up through the, the aggy pipe and stores into the pebbles. Now, what you do on the top of that is add about 30 centimeters of soil and this basically draws up the moisture from below there'll be a a, um, a, a kind of like a, a weed mat barrier that is in between the pebbles and the soil so that the the roots stay above that and don't go right down into the bottom what i find is that uh, these gardens are really useful in those compacted and hard areas and get some really good leafy green matter growing. They do sink down quite um, readily so you do need to keep topping them up and to get them started you also need to make sure you do some top watering. You can't just assume that straight away it's going to absorb from the bottom. I, I really prefer gardening in the soil if it's possible. Uh, because you have the the soil is is a place where you, you know you've got so much more going on there's so much more soil life you have the capacity for the roots to go so much deeper um, and also the it stays cooler the, the the soil stays cooler and the plants are a lot happier in that environment however if there is an issue with really dry as I said really dry really compacted soil or perhaps that you know maybe it's a, a temporary garden set up or you have soil contamination then these sorts of garden beds are kind of useful for you um, the one last thing I just wanted to mention you can see here there's the overflow pipe and now the overflow pipe ensures that the the soil doesn't get waterlogged so any surplus water that you're putting in through this pipe can just drain out the side and it would be a really good idea to collect that and use that for something if you could as well. So it's really important to try to do as much as you can to prevent the loss of the moisture that you have stored in the soil. You're really trying to avoid the, the evaporation and the, um, from, from you know sun exposure on the soil. So whatever you can do to cover the soil, you know really in a garden bed the ideal is not to be able to see the soil. So either with mulch, with cover, with cover crops, with polycultural gardens, with multiple layers, with a dense planting of a diversity of, of plants. And so this way, this, the moisture is, is staying in the soil, it's getting drawn up by the plants, but it's not actually just getting baked by the sun. And of course, um, mulch in most environments Unless, you know, it's really cold environment, you're wanting to get the soil to heat up, um, I would be mulching as much as you can. The fifth point that I wanted to mention about creating water resilience is around reusing water. So there are many different examples around your house um, and around different gardens that are about water reuse. Now what happens to the water <clears throat> that comes out of your kitchen for example? What happens to the water that comes out of your laundry? What happens to the water that flows off if you're washing something off in the garden? How can you collect and, and reuse that back in your garden um, for best effect? Uh, there's so many different ways. Um, on the left is a picture from Ceres in Melbourne. It's a community garden and one of the things that they have um, is a water collection point where they collect water from the main cafe area and draw it up into the top of this um, organic market garden area. They clean the water through flow forms and a reed bed. You can see the reed bed tumbling down the hill from pond to pond and then it gets fed back along the contours 
into each of the garden beds. So it's a fantastic way to be collecting water from somewhere else and reusing it back into the landscape. Too often, the water is just coming into our house and flowing off straight away. You know, we've become very good at this in, in Australia and many of the cities where there have been water restrictions. People are collecting water in their bath, people are collecting water in their sink or water from the, the washing up or from the, um, from the uh, laundry. If you can do that, that is such a great thing. But it also means you need to be um, mindful of the types of things that you are using in terms of cleaners so that you're not putting out um, contaminants into the soil that's going to be growing your food. I really like this middle, the, pic, the concept in this middle picture. It's the idea of, of washing up your vegetables and, and doing that kind of work out in the middle of the garden. And as you can see, there's a little pipe that comes out the back and that gets fed into a little channel which re redirects water back into the landscape. So it kind of averts that issue of needing to do it inside and collecting it and taking it back outside. I think it's a really simple way and you can see here there's a very, um, so you can set up a little table with a, a sink that you can get from the local tip shop and, and put a little stand to hold up um, a simple hose and that's a, a really great thing to, to be able to do. On the, on the um, right, there is a picture of um, my grey water system. So from, my ha so from my house, the water from my um, shower and kitchen uh, and any hand basins. Uh, we don't have toilet flush water because we have a dry composting toilet. So there's actually quite a small amount of water that comes out of the house. It goes into this grey water system. So basically it's a five metre long uh, pit. There's half a metre deep and about a metre wide and it has a one in a hundred slope. So the water comes in and gradually flows through this reed bed and the plants absorb the moisture and cleanse the water. And as the water flows out the other side, it gets sent into first a banana pit and then also redistributed um, to orchard areas. Number six, the point that I wanted to make here was about planting well or selecting your plants well. Now, one of the things that I think is really important in order to create a thriving garden that is drought tolerant and, and resilient to changes in, in rainfall patterns is to grow plants that are really hardy and resilient. Now I've picked a lot of the plants that I have in my garden as the basis of the, what I call the skeleton of my garden, the, the real foundations of my garden, the plants that when I went away and I was doing permaculture work internationally for about nine months and I came home and these were the plants that were growing without any watering, without any help, without any assistance whatsoever. Uh, so some of these ones are, um, I've got the edible canna, which is the one on the left and it grows up. I use that as a mulch material and um, as a part of a kind of a vegetative swale as well. But it has these swollen tubers at the base, which you can snap off the new ones that come off without disturbing the main plant, which I think is a really important point to be able to grow plants, which you can keep the main root, main roots in the soil so that they're going deeper to collect more moisture and they're connecting into the whole mycelium network, which is extending the roots of these plants enormously. Uh, so canna the edible canna i use as my potato there's also things like cassava which is the next one along which is a really drought hardy plant uh, pigeon pea is another one that i use uh, this is the third one along which is uh, a legume a tree legume so you can grow uh, it's what's used in india what has been used for the last three thousand years as a as a dal and so this plant is so many different functions from uh, from providing food uh, for us, providing food for the chickens, providing leafy material which I can use as chop and drop which goes back and helps to improve the soil and the moisture holding capabilities. Um, it's a short-lived plant so that for maybe four or five years it will grow and then when it dies back it's accumulated nitrogen on its on the roots in nodules so when it's died back it then <clears throat> does a sort of a, a slow release fertilizer back into the soil so that improves it but the other thing that I really like about this plant too is it provides a sort of a, a small canopy over my garden in the summertime which means that it's providing dappled 
dappled light so that my other plants that I want to grow aren't getting completely baked. And you see some gardens have shade structures built over them. I really like living shade um, and that, are, <clears throat> that is food as well. And kale is a fantastic plant that's really hardy. I've had it growing for years in my garden, particular ones that just keep going and going. And so it might sort of retreat for a little bit, it'll come back and it's, it's so hardy and so easy to grow in so many different contexts. So these plants are some of the ones that, that I grow, but what it means is that you do need to think about possibly eating differently. So let me explain a little bit more. So in this, this is my garden. Um, and rather than growing things like, you know, carrots and spinaches and lots of lettuces and, uh, you know, cabbages and things that are typical in most, you know, in the sort of the standard vegetable garden. If I asked you to close your eyes and think about what, what sort of plants would be growing in a vegetable garden, they're probably some of the things that you'd mention. Um, what I've tried to do is to create a garden whereby I can access most of the greens that I use on a daily basis from perennial plants. And what this means, as I said before, is that the or perennial plants and also self-seeding plants that are there for a really long time and are very hardy. So these plants have their roots deep down in the soil and they are really accessing deeper moisture and have the root extenders of the mycelium threads through the garden. And this whole garden acts as a community. So it's expanding it beyond the idea of companion planting into that the whole garden is a community and these big long beds that have connection throughout them are all supporting each other in, in this in this and also you can see a lot of these plants too are starting to tumble over the terrace walls which then helps to protect the terrace walls and the soil behind it more importantly and the soil life that's in in there uh, from heating up in in the hot times so some of the leaves that I use all the time are things like pumpkin leaves and Brazilian spinach and Suriname spinach, cranberry hibiscus, um, even young turmeric leaves and, and young taro leaves, sweet potato leaves and shoots are fantastic and, and young yacon leaves too. So all of these things, there's so, many, so much more food in here too that I'm not pointing to at the moment, but I wanted to particularly mention those because in order to grow a, a drought resilient garden or a, a you know a water resilient garden actually thinking about the different sorts of plants that can survive and and prosper and and thrive in a low water environment an environment that is uh, perhaps a little bit more self-managing then these are the sorts of plants that I've become to I've come to rely on so it'd be really interesting for you to look around at your garden a little bit more a little bit differently and and think about what are the plants that grow very easily without much help and assistance particularly in the dry times and really think about how you can expand and, su and, and support their growth and utilize them more so it does mean eating differently so for example pumpkin leaves I every every meal pretty much I would gather the young pumpkin leaves and just chop them up as I would a silver beet that any of the prickles on them um, disappear as soon as you start um, cooking them up um, so for example for lunch um, I went up into the chickens and I got an egg and I came back down and I grabbed a pumpkin leaf and some Brazilian spinach and um, what else a few different herbs that were around the garden and I sliced them up and uh, put put it in the egg and just cooked it up as a little omelette it was absolutely fantastic other times I toss pumpkin leaves into the soup uh, and then it just gets blended through or as a stir fry anything really you can use it as a leafy green and it's really it's a very tender green it's and it's a lovely flavor and the cranberry hibiscus um, has more of a, a lemony flavor uh, more like sorrel um, I think it's also known as Jamaican sorrel and it's kind of a very interesting um, color to add into your meals as well. Turmeric leaves, if you get the nice young ones, um, haven't got too fibrous and a really lovely addition into a stir fry. Um, sweet potato leaves I use just all the time as well and they're um, very much like the pumpkin leaves. Suriname spinach and Brazilian spinach are the summer vigorous plants so these are the plants that I'm talking about in particular that in a garden when you think oh gosh it's it's a hot summer I can't really grow all these things 
these are some of the plants that that I really rely on. Now, um, having said that, I'm a subtropical garden. You might be in a completely different environment. And as I said before, I really encourage you to look at all of the plants that you have in your garden that are more perennial plants that thrive in, um, you know, thrive with neglect, thrive with dryness, and that you can use as some of your main sources of food. So it might mean actually diving in and looking more deeply at all the different plants that you have and um, possibly even looking up um, things like the plants for a future database and finding out what are some of the perennial edible plants that are in your garden, that are in your climate that you can incorporate into your garden. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful exploration and maybe, you know, it's, it's a transition that you can have over time to think about how you can grow differently, how you can eat differently. There is really no difference in the taste or flavor. If you're cooking up these sorts of plants as part of a, a, a blend of things in a spinach bake or in a soup or a stir fry, you know, people often tell me, oh, but you know, I can't get my family to eat, a, you know, the pumpkin leaves. Well, I probably wouldn't like to eat a big blob of, of silver beet either, but I really like it incorporated into a whole lot of different foods. Same as with the pumpkin, the Brazilian spinach, the Suriname. I really like these plants and I like their flavor and blended with all different sorts of things from the garden. So thank you for listening so far. And uh, I really wanted to tell you a little bit more about um, the permaculture educators program, which I'm running through the Permaculture Education Institute. We currently have about 100 people who are registered in this program from around the world. And it's a self-paced course, which means that you can start anytime, register anytime, learn in your community, in your place with the support of an international network and direct mentoring. So that at the end of this program, not only have you designed your own garden or your community garden or school garden, and you've started to implement parts of that design, and you've also learned how to become a permaculture teacher in that process. So this course, the thing that I'm really excited to share with you is that now um, we've just looked at creating partnerships with different organizations so that this course can become the first year of further study with organizations such as Guy University. Now they have um, diploma programs and master's programs so this course is a really significant course and will soon be accredited as being part of that program so that is a really exciting thing and it gives and it shows to I suppose um, to you that this is really um, a, a very comprehensive program that is really highly regarded internationally the other thing that I want to share with you that I'm very excited about too is that I'm in the next month I'm traveling to Africa to work with students in Africa and also to work with them to develop up a program next year in their local village. And we're inviting people who are students of this program to actually travel with me to East Africa to co-teach and gain really amazing, valuable experience teaching in this context. Uh, so if you would like to look at either of those things or you'd simply like to become a permaculture teacher in your own community, please um, do visit the website here, which is permacultureeducationinstitute.org. Registrations open anytime. And, and as I said, it's a self-paced course. So a module is released every week, which means that you can sign up and, and work through it at a nice pace. A couple of hours each week is all you need to work through this. Um, or you can take it as you need to. Some people who are part of the course sort of do a, do a sort of a flurry of activity and then take a few weeks off as they need to do something else and they come back to it and that's absolutely okay there are no deadlines there's no stress about any of that it's really designed to be flexible enough to weave around your life as as it is now so that you can make a transition into um, perhaps a permaculture livelihood um, over this next year or two so just to recap on the topics that we've explored in creating a resilient garden in terms of water. So 
The six concepts that I talked about were one, to slow it, to slow the water down. The second one is about spreading it. So making sure that you're actually collecting it and spreading it and sinking it into the soil um, and holding it in the soil as much as possible. The soil is one of your best stores of water in the landscape. But there are other ways to store it too, whether it be ponds or, or tanks. Um, and also to think about how you've used water once and how you can use it again and again and again and how as many different ways that you can have it being reused in your landscape would be absolutely fantastic. Um, now the other thing, the final thing, is really about your choice and selection of plants and planting well to be really resilient to those changes you know you can tell as soon as you look out in your garden and you see some some plants starting to wilt when it gets dry but there's other ones that are flourishing note that be really observant and start to look at how you can emphasize the plants that really thrive in all different environments particularly the dry times and then utilize those more effectively throughout your garden to be the food that you rely on and so as i said to really thinking about how you can eat differently so thank you for attending this master class master class number 12 our next master class and the final master class for 2018 um, will be on november the 26th um, so i'm interested to hear from you what topic you would like to explore the topics are um, up I'll put it up on a little poll and you'll be able to see that so please make a vote now um, don't forget too that you can continue on now and and chat for the next 15 minutes if you're attending live I'll be here for the next 15 minutes to field more questions and um, Thank you again. That's Maura Gamble, uh, permacultureeducationinstitute.org. If you would like to send me an email to find out more about the opportunities that are presenting themselves with, with Africa or to, to find out more about the permaculture course itself, um, or if you're interested in um, taking on a part, being part of this course to get further accreditation, please do email me at morag at permacultureeducationinstitute.org. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next time.